The 20th century has become the most amazing period of change we have ever seen. We entered into it struggling to fly. And we left it in supersonic airplanes and space shuttles that lifted us beyond Earth's atmosphere. We entered in sailboats. And we left it in nuclear-powered submarines, gigantic ocean liners, and massive aircraft carriers. Now we have crossed the threshold into the 21st century, which holds promise of even greater accomplishments and innovations. And though most of these stunning developments and possibilities are wonderful, this tremendous increase in knowledge has led to a widespread rejection of the Bible as our civilization's moral standard. This is unfortunate because the Bible has served as the foundation of our Western culture for centuries and its moral principles are there so that mankind can live in harmony with each other. The Bible, or scriptures as it's sometimes called, is a book that has endured relentless attacks from atheists, agnostics, the secular media, many in academic circles, and even liberal clergy from all faiths, including Christianity. These attacks have led many people to believe that the Bible is only a compilation of stories and myths from ancient times with little or no relevance for our contemporary lives. Despite what the world may say, the Bible boldly declares that every one of its words is inspired by Almighty God. The word inspired means that God overshadowed the minds and spirits of the human writers, directing them to write the precise words found in the Bible. In fact, the Apostle Paul declares, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. To have an appreciation for what this means, we will need to have a closer look at how the Bible came into existence and later see if its claims of divine inspiration can be validated. There are two testaments in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament was written by Jews who wrote in their native Hebrew language. The New Testament, on the other hand, was written in Greek and also by Jews. To this day, Jewish people regard only the Old Testament as their sacred text, whereas Christians follow both the Old and New Testaments. In the Old Testament, there are 39 books written between 2000 B.C. and 400 B.C. These books were canonized as divinely inspired scriptures at about 200 B.C. In those early centuries, the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek, the most common language in that time. This translation became known as the Septuagint. In Old Testament times, God used prophets to speak to the Jewish people in Israel. In regard to his prophets, God said, I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I commanded him. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. In other words, any prophet who claimed to be speaking on God's behalf had to go through a test. That prophet had to make predictions of short-term future events, and these predictions had to come true. Other criteria were employed as well. The prophecies had to be precise and beyond a person's ability to manipulate, calculate, or control. Prophets had to be sure 
that what they spoke forth was true and accurate in every respect, because if they got even one detail wrong, they would be executed by stoning. In such a case, the prophet's message would be totally disregarded. If the prophet's short-term predictions came true, however, he was held in high esteem by the people as a man sent by God. The words of true prophets were regarded as God's words, and they were incorporated into the scriptures and teachings of the Jewish people. Daniel was one of God's prophets who earned his reputation while in captivity in Babylon by passing every test. He spoke forth and wrote down God's words to his people during a very difficult time in Jewish history. About 2,600 years ago, in 606 BC, Daniel and many other Jews were taken captive by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. One night, King Nebuchadnezzar had a troubling dream. He began to lose sleep because of this vision, and so he issued a call for magicians, enchanters, and sorcerers of his kingdom to come and interpret his dream for him. These wise men asked him to describe his dream to them so that they would be able to interpret it. Nebuchadnezzar had a different plan, however. He put them to the test by asking them first to reveal the contents of his dream and then give the interpretation. He reasoned that if these men truly had supernatural powers, they would know what he had dreamt as well as the interpretation. This proved to be quite a challenge for these wise men of Babylon, so they protested. This enraged the king, so he commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be put to death. This royal order meant that Daniel and his three Jewish companions would also be put to death, for they were among the wise in the king's palace in those days. When Daniel learned of this decree, he immediately went to pray, seeking God's mercy and asking the Lord to give him both the dream and its interpretation. In a night vision, God revealed the mystery, the content, and the meaning of the king's dream to Daniel. With the king's permission, Daniel proceeded to describe the dream. He said, you looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel's narration of the king's dream was completely accurate in every detail, and this must have shaken the king to the core. Daniel went on to interpret the dream's meaning. He pointed out that the symbols within the dream corresponded to four successive world empires. Daniel revealed that the image's head of gold represented the kingdom of Babylon. He said, you are the head of gold, meaning that Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler of this first kingdom. The prophet went on to explain, after you, another kingdom will rise inferior to yours. Later, Daniel identified this inferior kingdom as the kingdom of Medo-Persia. The New American Commentary states, 
History is plain that the next great power to appear on the world scene was the Medo-Persian Empire, led by the dynamic Cyrus the Great. In fulfillment of Daniel's interpretation, this kingdom conquered Babylon in 539 BC and reigned for more than 200 years. Daniel goes on to tell the king that a third kingdom would emerge. He said, a third kingdom, one of bronze. As he had done with regard to Medo-Persia, Daniel later identified this third kingdom as Greece, a kingdom that would be ruled by a powerful king, and he explained that the king of Greece at the height of his power would be broken off, and four less powerful kingdoms would emerge from his nation. History confirms Daniel's prophecy, for the kingdom of Greece, under the leadership of Alexander the Great, defeated the Medo-Persians in a series of battles. The Greeks then dominated the world from 331 to 146 BC. Alexander the Great died at the height of his conquests at the age of 33. Thereafter, four of his top generals seized the empire and divided it into four less powerful kingdoms in fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Daniel continued his interpretation by describing a fourth great kingdom that would be as strong as iron and a kingdom that would smash and crush all previous empires. History tells us that the next world empire after the Greeks was the Roman Empire. This empire dominated the known world for almost 500 years, starting in 146 BC. As Daniel had predicted, the Roman Empire conquered more territory than any of the three earlier empires. The most important detail about this fourth kingdom is what Daniel says next. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. A little later, we'll take an in-depth look at the meaning of this verse. Besides knowing and understanding the mystery of the king's dreams, Daniel also predicted that the king would suffer insanity and predicted accurately that the king's sanity would eventually be restored. Daniel also prophesied to the king's son, King Belshazzar that he would lose the kingdom of Babylon to the Medes and Persians. On the very night when this prediction was given, Belshazzar lost both his kingdom and his life. Sixteen days later, Cyrus, the Persian monarch, marched into Babylon. As predicted, King Cyrus had an inferior kingdom, so he ruled the Medo-Persian Empire from Babylon. Because Daniel made so many detailed, short-term prophecies with 100% accuracy, he was regarded by the Jews as a divine prophet. His writings, the book of Daniel, were retained as a divinely inspired book of the Old Testament. 